Hello and welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Tim Miller, in for Charlie Sykes today, who is on a well-deserved vacation. I'll be here with you for the next two days. I have two fantastic guests, and you guys are going to enjoy it. Thursday, JVL is in, and boy, am I jealous of his guest on Thursday. Friday, Mona is in the hot seat, so we've got a good week for you while Charlie tends to the grandchildren. Today, I have a wonderful guest, Alex Holder, a documentary filmmaker whose new movie, Unprecedented, you can watch right now on Discovery+. Plus. But before we get to the guests, I just want to talk briefly about the news from my old friend Lindsey Graham over the weekend saying that there'll be riots in the street if Trump is prosecuted. You know, for those who haven't made it through the book, Why We Did It, I told a story about me and Lindsey sitting in a bar in New York. Now get your head out of the gutter, people. Everything was good. Jeb was there too. We were, I was after a long day on the campaign trail and me and Jeb were drinking scotch. Lindsay was having a buttery shard and he went on and on deep into the night to Jeb's annoyance, frankly, um, ranting about how much he hated Donald Trump, how much Trump was a racist, how Trump is a jerk and how he's awful and how we, we can't let him win. We can't let him win. And, and I kind of write about this and, and looking back on it and, and, and trying to kind of understand how somebody that could have such a strong moral and ethical view against Donald Trump could justify doing the kinds of things that, that Lindsey Graham has come around to. I look back on that now, and I think maybe I, I misunderstood something that Lindsey was arguing. That whole night he was arguing within the context of how Donald Trump can't win because of these things. And, and I think that there is a direct line between that conversation and Lindsey Graham's feeling on January 6th that he was ready to move on from Donald Trump because he believed that everyone else was going to be ready to move on from Donald Trump. And I think now we're actually seeing the true manifestation of Lindsey Graham, somebody whose top priority, who wanted so much to be near power, not in power, but near power and around power, that he wanted to win so badly that now he recognizes clearly, finally, after like a decade, his own voters for who they are and what they're willing to do and what he needs to do to stay in their good graces. And I think that it's pretty debased when you think about it. And I thought that it was an interesting thing for us all to ruminate on the why Lindsey Graham question, because I think we have a lot more clarity. And as we move into this conversation with our with our guest today, um, I'm excited to have somebody who is able to achieve access to power um, and <laughs> able to be around power without having to uh, lower themselves to the degree that, that Lindsey Graham has to show everybody that that is possible. But first, I want to have a quick interlude from our friends at Widespread Panic. We're going to get into some dirty business. Alex Holder, I'm just so, so happy that you're willing to do this. Uh, we had just quite a chance, marvelous, serendipitous first meetup in Washington, D.C. in late June, I guess it was. Uh, yeah. I think that you had been subpoenaed by the January 6th committee on Tuesday. I was having my book launch party on Saturday, and a mutual friend said, did you see the news about this guy that got subpoenaed? I'm with him, and and uh, I want to come to the party. Can him and his crew come along? And I said, yeah, sure, no, whatever, no problem. We'd love to see everybody. And uh, what I did not realize was that, you know, you'd be, be pulling up black SUVs, full security, <laughs> <laughs> worried, worried that the deplorables were coming for you. What was that first week like for you after kind of the reveal to the world that you had that had this footage that that had been, I guess, a relatively close hold secret up until that point? Yeah, I mean, it was completely crazy. I mean, the I think I was actually remembering a moment where this all started. I was sitting in LAX airport. This is before I had security and before the shit hit the fan, flying out for the, the subpoena in DC. And it was me and my lawyer, Russell, and we're sitting at the Hard Rock uh, cafe restaurant thing in LAX. And behind me, there's this massive TV screen. <laughs> I turn my head randomly and see literally like the banner at the bottom saying, you know, British filmmaker Alex Holder, and there's a picture of me that they got off the website. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? I mean, it was absolutely insane. Um, and then when we arrive into DC, there's literally the big black uh, suburban is there and 
yeah, there, there's a guy that's actually managed to get through security on the other side, like on the air side, like like sort of frog marching me out the airport. There was two of them actually. Oh man, that's legit. It was pretty crazy, the whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. And then and then I end up at your party with every single political journalist in America. <laughs> it's all there. <laughs> it was maybe a bad judgment call for you to show up there, but I I liked it. It brought an air of uh seriousness to the proceedings. It was like, you know, once you get the security dudes there. But I, I want to just dive back a little bit before that because, you know, you can be a little cheeky, you Brits. So I'm gonna be a little cheeky with you for a second. I hope you don't get too offended. But I was looking at your little CV here. And your previous documentary before this one, uh, which you can uh, watch on Discovery Plus called Unprecedented, uh, was a documentary about a group called the Bad Boy Chiller Crew. <laughs> I'm, I'm into music, but I don't, I've never heard of the Bad Boy Chiller Crew. Uh, it looks like an electronic outfit. Um, uh, so how, like... Can just can we get to square one? I mean, what? How did you end up being the last person to interview Donald Trump before he he left the White House? Like, what, like t- where did it start? What was the embryo? Did you pitch them? Did someone come to you? Oh, he really loves the Bad Boy Chiller Crew. That's how he got. Oh, him. is that it? <laughs> he loves the Queen and the Bad Boy Chiller Crew. <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, I think with, with previous projects, there there are sort of associations with projects that you have where you didn't have much material impact. So I wouldn't want to take away any of the credit for those that worked very hard on that particular show. <laughs> okay. but, but the, the 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 documentary I'd done previous to to that was a was a was a documentary. A feature about this neo-Nazi who discovered that he was Jewish. Um, he had actually set up the largest far-right party in in Europe, and you know, he was an outspoken anti-Semite, sort of like a little mini Hitler. And um, this is all based in Hungary. And he discovers that he's Jewish, which is kind of a problem if you're a neo-Nazi. And he's then fired from his own political party that he had set, earlier set up, and then embraces Orthodox Judaism. And that actually did quite well. It was at the Tribeca wow. Film Festival, and and that sort of started this journey of me you know, falling in love, I guess, with documentaries. And I've been working on this project. It's not finished yet, still uh, in the making, about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And during the process of making that, so I picked these really easy subjects. And, <laughs> uh, and so during the process of making that, I was in the States and I interviewed various people that had connections with the Trump White House. And through Just like that, the Abraham Accords and whatever. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. And then through that, I was introduced to the family. But I mean, the pitch really originally was to various people that were close and associated with the Trump family was, it would be really cool to make a documentary about President Trump and his and his eldest kids. And this is around about February 2020, so before COVID hits America. And, and it, it was a ridiculous pitch. I mean, everyone wants to make a film about the sitting president of the United States, especially <laughs> Donald Trump, right? And his kids. But I think the way this uh, family operates is it's sort of like a mafia type family, right? So, so it starts off the family. So anyone the family knows immediately gets sort of quote unquote access. And then friends, but friends who they've known for 20, 30 years and who've worked for them uh, over time. So it's all about loyalty and relationships. And I think that the you know, an introduction to them was the first difficult thing, right? And then at the end of the day, they're you know, big boys and big girl. And, and I told them what I wanted to do and what I was not willing to do. And and they were all for it. And, and I think the reason they were for it was really down to this hubris. I mean, they were going to repeat the 2016 election. The polls were all wrong. And as Don Jr. likes to say to everyone, let's make liberals cry again. So you know, that was that was the premise. I think that was the main reason. They were very, very confident. And then perhaps after that, it was... That I didn't really have much political or any political skin in the game in the fact that I'm not American. So they, they obviously have a deep mistrust towards the, what they call the mainstream media. And uh, I think that was, you know, I would, did you tell them you were MAGA? I mean, uh, just, just generally, oh, no. you would think that a no. British per, I mean, Trump has to have like an 18% approval rating in Britain. And you, I guess you've done a documentary <laughs> about former anti Semites. So, uh, you know, I just, it doesn't seem like you would have been a, I don't know, it would have seemed like they would have gotten a recommendation from Steve Bannon or something instead of you. Right. Yeah. I mean, the introduction for sure is important, but maybe it was the way I came across, which was, I want to hear from you. And you you guys have been complaining for so long about the way you've been covered. So here I am. Let's do this. And let's use the campaign as like the backdrop for this, uh, for this, this chronicle of uh, what's going to happen next. And I think 
look, I mean, I certainly didn't think they were going to try and destroy democracy at that point. And definitely the beauty of documentary is not knowing what's going to happen next, right? So following it through. And, and to be honest, the project didn't happen in this seamless way. I mean, it was lots of stops and starts and and just crazy shit happening all the way through. I mean, there's well, numerous Yeah, I, I'm sure people want to hear the behind the scenes. But before we do it, let's just get the basics down because I was trying to figure yeah. this out as we watched it. So you did three interviews with Trump and then it looks like several with the kids and maybe one with Mike Pence. So so what, what's just a really quick chronology of uh, the yeah. first interview happened and, and how many you had with each of them? Sure. So we started off with Eric at Trump Tower and then following that... Which is what, like summer before the election? That was in September, September okay, 20th. September, okay. Yeah. And then Eric invited us on the campaign after we did the interview with him and we were filming with him on, in Nevada in Vegas and we put together like a little clip and then we showed it to his sister, Ivanka, and she was like, I want that. <laughs> so, we then, <laughs> so we then joined on with her. So it sort of evolved over Got like it. this whole thing. So we did this, so we did it with Ivanka. Prayed on their vanity. I see. Okay. Uh, now, now yeah, it's like, well. <laughs> that's exactly right. And to be honest, they did do a lot of campaign rallies in one yeah. day. So the only way of, of catching up with them was for us to charter a, a private plane. So we were literally in this private plane flying across America, trying to catch up with Ivanka and her team. So we did it with Ivanka, and then we then did an interview with her at their hotel in D.C., of which she spent about 10 minutes talking about how she designed it, which was fascinating, obviously. And Don Jr.'s interview, actually, was about four or five days before Election Day, actually, which was pretty remarkable. And we also joined Don on the campaign rallies that he did. And then we were going to interview the president, but then he unfortunately got COVID on the same day that we were at the White House interviewing Jared Kushner. And I had actually gone to bed that night. I mean, you can't really make this stuff up. I mean, every single day, there was almost something happening that we were in some way, you know, close to. So we're in the White House with the very people that potentially could have also got COVID as well. And I remember going to bed early that night, waking up and seeing my phone had basically exploded. And it, it sounded like somebody had died because I couldn't really work out what was going on. And that night was when Trump revealed that he had COVID or, or was being taken. I think that, yeah, that sure. later that day he was taken to hospital. So then we didn't get him. And then we were then invited onto Air Force One and to interview him on Air Force One, which is a pretty fucking cool thing to do, right? I mean, I never thought I'd ever have to say that sentence, right? That I was on Air Force One. And we, so we went on Air Force One and then we were meant to interview him on there. And then Mark Meadows came up and said that he couldn't do the interview because he had to take a, an important phone call which, if memory serves me correctly, I'm 99% sure that phone call was with the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin. And I remember thinking... Have you, have you seen <laughs> anything since that? I was going to ask you about that. This was in my rapid fire questions at the end, because you mentioned that when you talked to Ryan Lizza. Has that ever been confirmed that he had talked so, to Putin nine days before the election? So a reporter did a real deep dive into this and worked out that that very day, Putin had made a statement against Trump, something to do with Biden's son or something. So there was some statement that happened that day that Putin came out with. So that was when it, Trump had asked Putin to Trump does so much insane shit that you kind of forget <laughs> this. But like it was the day that Trump had asked Putin to help him with the Hunter Biden docs. It was like a flashback to, uh, you know, to give me the Hillary emails. And and Putin had, I guess, said something dismissive right. about that. Right, right. So, yes, yeah, so it seems to be too much of a coincidence for, for that not to have been uh, the case. And I remember really clearly thinking like, oh, fair enough. I mean, like, you know, uh, uh, he could take his call with the president of Russia and I'll wait. Mark Meadows um, doesn't seem smart enough to be trolling you about that, <laughs> I guess. I guess that's the only other explanation I could think of is that he was trolling you. But that doesn't yeah. seem... Yeah, I mean, to be honest, not. I mean, of all, all the people that I came across you know, during making this work were really... Very unimpressive, actually. Um, surprisingly, uh, but uh, but anyway, we uh, we so we didn't do the interview with him on on Air Force One, uh, but we did see how Trump uses the machinery and the apparatus of the presidency to you know, engender this you know, image to his uh, to his fans, which is pretty remarkable. I mean, it's almost like Kim Jong Un like. I mean, you yeah. know, he uses all the all the things. And there's just one hilarious story where he actually times the takeoff of Air Force One to coincide with the crescendo of Ness and Dormer, which is just absolutely uh, outrageous um, and hilarious. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so then, so we then were sort of coming towards election day. We hadn't yet uh, interviewed Trump, but we'd interviewed all the kids. And the election day happens. 
and then we get silence. There's now no more interaction with the family at all. And I'm obviously very disappointed that we hadn't yet interviewed President Trump. And then I'll never forget any of this. I was driving down to see a family member on a Friday afternoon. And you know when you sometimes get on your phone, like if AT&T call, even if you haven't got that number saved on your phone, it still shows AT&T? Yeah, sure. Was, yeah, so I'm driving down and suddenly like the White House appears on my phone. I was like, what the hell? So uh, I answer it. And it was basically one of his staffers inviting us to do an interview with President Trump. The interview took place on the 5th of December. And that's sort of how it went. It was always very quick. It was always, we had to really move. And the people I had working for me at the time, still do, are just unbelievable on how they were able to manage all this. The thing is, and it's similar to me. So in the last chapter of my book, I interviewed, this is such a much lower example, but I think it's a parallel. My old friend, Caroline Wren, who is on the, you know, I met her. on the permit on the mall. Yeah, I, I saw her. She's in the documentary. She's in it. Yeah. So I'd love for your two cents on her. But the context of this is, in the book, I don't think I'm particularly kind to her, but I (laughs) am just kind of a mirror, though, of what she wants to explain herself. You know, I'd like let her explain herself. And my view, like the way in which she explains herself is preposterous and the arguments are not particularly defensible. But, you know, after it came out, I think she looks at it and is like, you know, this is what I, right? Like we live in these two different worlds, right? So people who, you know, are of the persuasion that Caroline is and, and is, is deep in Trump world, she looks at it and says, I don't, you know, I don't know, maybe I disagree with this line or that line, but it seems like basically this is a reflection of my point of view. And I feel like that's how this documentary, I, I, I watched it all last night and how it's really remarkable and interesting and engaging, but it is, you really are giving them the rope and letting them hang themselves exactly. with, throughout the right. entire documentary, right? Exactly. I mean, it is, like, had they not tried to steal the election and done a coup, I, very well might have been a documentary that comes out kind of, uh, you know, that they might have liked. Absolutely. And, and to be honest, I mean, I, I don't know why they wouldn't even like it some of them still think that I mean, the president thinks that what happened on January 6th was an acceptable outcome. But yeah, I mean, there are a few reasons for this. I mean, one is, is that, yes, you give them the rope and they can do it themselves. I mean, you know, that scene with Don Jr. where he says how the state of journalism is so bad and he had to then go and actually write a book. And, you know, and, I mean, it's just absolutely ludicrous. <laughs> Don Jr.'s <laughs> ranting. He's like, these guys don't work and, and they shut me down from COVID so I couldn't go to work or go to church like he does either of those things. So I had no choice but to write a book. You know, during the pandemic, I couldn't go to work. I couldn't go to church. I couldn't go to school. So I was sitting at home for four months. I wrote a book because I was bored. Not because I'm a journalist or a researcher. I was bored. I go, let me see what's out here about you. Wow, that's kind of a big deal. You know, you have a 50-year track record. Not one person in journalism picked up a pen or started opening a book. Uh, But that's the state of journalism. You know, that a guy like me has to step up. And perhaps that's why I've made a name for myself within politics. um, Because I'm just willing to be like, hey, guys, like, I'm calling bullshit. Oh, my God. All right, buddy. Yeah. You know, I mean, like you weren't pressing them, right? Like, no, they, like no. they, they were looking, they were looking and sounding ridiculous, but just because they were spending a lot of time defending the indefensible and complimenting themselves. Exactly, exactly. I mean, again, you know, Don talking about his like um, political genesis, I guess, right? Is is when he went to Czechoslovakia back then, and and he's so petrified that the that communism could come to America, and you know, it's ludicrous. <laughs> I spent most of the time trying not to laugh. <laughs> but I think that the main point, though, was really that I wasn't there to try and change minds. Obviously, that's ridiculous because I can't change these people's minds. And also to record like history, essentially. Right. I mean, to record this is what these people who were running the country essentially were thinking and doing at this very moment. And so what's so unusual about all of this is that I became sort of the story more than the series, in a sense, because of the subpoena. But. I'm barely in the series. It's not like a normal yeah, TV no. interview where you see the interviewer. It's all about them and they're narrating it. So, and, and obviously we use journalists as well to um, contextualize some of the absolute nonsense they talk about. But ultimately, it was never about me. It was about them. And so I didn't want to engage with them and try and change minds or argue with them that they're wrong because these people aren't rational, right? I mean, you tell Donald Trump the sky is, is, not, is not orange. It's, it's it's blue. He'll just maintain the fact that it's orange. And then at that point, you've wasted all your time and you've gained nothing. So that was my thought process. So I want to go through the kids. To me, it seems like 
maybe you brought a little bit of uh, the British monarchical view to this mindset of this family and uh, the way the treatment and it was a big focus on like the kids and and whether you know one of them might be inheritor of his political kind of machine and kind of a sense of them as a family you know that's like maybe a little hint of kind of how the how the royal family is covered and so I just I, I want to go through the kids a little bit one by one but I, I, I'm curious you're just brought a sense of them having got to spend, it sounds like a decent amount of time with Eric and Ivanka, maybe a little less with Don Jr. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, in, in brief, really, they care about one thing and one thing only, which is Trump and the brand, right? Well, it's the same thing, really. I mean, they just care about doing whatever they can to ensure that their father remains in power and that Trump is not associated with defeat, right? That's all they care about. And that's all they know. They can't accept anything else. So, and, and there's, obviously um, friction between the three of them in terms of who's daddy's favorite and who's the most most likely to take over but the consensus is we will do everything we can come what may to ensure that that trump is uh, is, is associated with the winning and and that he and, and obviously practically that he remains in office yeah i thought the most striking part of it was you then are showing trump like these, the the interviews that you did with the kids, I guess, yeah, and getting him to respond to them. Like, how much of that did he did he watch? I just, it's hard for me to imagine Donald Trump actually caring about watching the other kids on video. Yeah, so it was fascinating, and I think you know those facial reactions that he has when I'm showing him on the iPad his kids campaigning for him is fascinating. And the best he can really say is how they have you know, support. And they've got their own base, but really it comes from his base. So like, it's a, yeah, it's a father talking about his kids who are doing you know work for him essentially, and he can't give them you know any credit or have to qualify it with the fact that really you know a- any interest that people have in them actually all comes from him. And the one that stands out to me is I guess you showed him, and Eric had been relaying that his mother Ivana had said that Donald was a terrible husband but a good president or something to that effect, and you showed that clip to him. Yeah, and he did. And he seemed a little awkward in the moment, trying to kind of contextualize that. I don't know what were did he did he get up back on his heels about any of these any of the clips? no. I mean, I, I mean, I think you know, in, in that particular moment, he he was very taken aback and, and quite awkward. And then he says, "But it's probably true." Uh, it was his <laughs> response, right? Uh, I.e., that everyone would think he's an amazing president, right? And I, I think with you know, he he's a very very unusual man. Donald Trump. I mean, in, in every way, he's a very simple person, but he's also a very unusual person. Yeah, he has this inability to understand why people don't like him unless he doesn't like them first. I mean, that, that's the, the world that he lives in. He, he is incapable of understanding anything other than total and absolute adoration towards him because he is the greatest person in the world, right? So when, you, when you're dealing with somebody like that, whether it comes to his children or whether it comes to his friends or or, or, or to anyone, he is all about him, and it's all about the things that he's associated with, or that he associates himself with, or that he owns, or yeah, or has. So, what was interesting with him, or was kind of frustrating, was that you can't get deep with him, right? right? The best you can get is, I mean, you would think showing him video clips of his own kids would think he's a bad husband. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, it's just like there's no real response except a few contortions on his face, right? Uh, I mean, that's what. The, the most insightful parts of ever, when you come to Donald Trump, the most insightful parts are those behind the scenes moments. You know, in, in our series, it's him moving the water glass around or, or moving the chair around to make sure it's centered in the frame. It's those moments which are obviously absolutely comical and hilarious and insane. But those are the moments where you actually get to see who he really is. So to this question of who he really is, I think obviously the main thrust and what everybody wants to know from you now like you're a mind reader you just got to spend a little bit of time with him is this sense for like what he really believed amidst all of this tumult and he's he's doing the, the other ridiculous thing about this water moving move the table move the cup of water <laughs> you know people they showed this the january 6th committee like all this is happening in the context of like he's attempting a coup <laughs> right it just shows you like his simple brain about what he's thinking about at a given moment but i want to play the clip of him and Eric both talking about the election fraud and the fallout. It's mathematically impossible to have lost the election. He didn't get 80 million votes, just so you understand, okay? Nor did he come close. I would do events across the street from Biden, and he would have 20 people, and you'd have Bon Jovi. 
And a guy like me, who has zero desire to be in politics, would have 750 people, 1,000 people. I like that clip because Biden was, was, was COVID, so Biden wasn't having events. But Eric's yeah. a guy like me. And I'm not exactly Bon Jovi over here. But um, to me, that actually sounded like dumb people who really think the election was stolen from them, actually. And I don't know, on some level, it doesn't really matter whether they really think so or not. But I am curious in your take on that, having spent time with them on camera and off camera during this tumultuous period. You, you know, we're in December when those interviews are taking place. Um, we're a month away from January 6th. What is your sense for their mindset? I agree with you. It's literally dumb people. I mean, and, and it's so difficult to say because I wish it was there was a better way of articulating it, but they really are. I mean, Eric, without question, completely and totally believes anything his father says. I mean, in, in every way, shape or form. So, I mean, and, and the number of times he said, I will never accept ever, you know, in, you know, in my dying days, I'll never, ever accept uh, that my father didn't win the 2020 election. So he absolutely believes it. And Trump believes it as well. I mean, he absolutely knew what he was doing when he was talking about how mail-in ballots were were, were problematic. And, and I think at that point, it was more just you know, part of the, the Trump game, right? I mean, he'd been undermining the sanctity of the vote back in 2016. You know, there's that famous clip with, after the debate with Hillary Clinton, where he says he'll accept the 2016 presidential election and he pauses and says, if I win. Right. Um, so he'd been playing with that for a long time. But eventually when push comes to shove and, and he actually lost, that there's just no way that he could rationalize that in his head because, of course, I didn't lose. Of course, they stole it from me. And he'd become somebody who, who buys into his lie. And he, he absolutely believed it. And that was something that shocked me because when I was at the White House, I was saying uh, to one of the crew that there was no way Trump really believes that this election was stolen and that. Yeah, it was sort of, I almost expected him to admit that in the interview. I mean, it was like, that was like what I was hoping. Or there would be like a showman's wink off stage. I guess this is it, my other question. Like, you're, so when you have time, you were with obviously some staff of his. You know, I talked to Alyssa Farah, who's I think quitting right around this time, right? Because she's is saying the same thing. I'm surprised that, that people are actually are believing this bullshit. But, you know, I would have expected that too if I was in your shoes. You go in and, and you're like, they, they all know that this is a joke, right? And like that there'd be some sort of, wink and nod or some sort of human acknowledgement that you know that this is a big scam and you know we're just going along with it to get along here until we're out of here next month but that wasn't the vibe you were picking up no not at all i mean in terms of his staff after we finished that interview there was this incredibly awkward silence and i then saw how scared the few people were that were in the room with us of him which was really fascinating it wasn't like uh, you know, a deference to the president of the United States. It was sheer terror. I mean, they were very, very, very scared of him. And that was very unusual. I felt that was very unusual. But, you know, he absolutely totally believes. It. I mean, in terms of other people around, there were a couple of comments. There, there were a few camps. There were those that believed it. And there were those that didn't think it was true, but they really hoped Trump would pull it off. Right. And then there were those that thought it was a bad idea, but they, they stayed for whatever reason. But uh, and including some of the people that were the closest to him, I had conversations with that thought it was a terrible idea and that he should, in fact, just go around the country, talk about how great he was and how he saved everyone with the COVID vaccinations and, you know, be civil to President Biden. Uh, that's what they were advocating. But on the whole, the people that I came across were totally in the same camp as Trump. In this latter category that you mentioned about people that thought it was a terrible idea and he should have been bragging, there was some leaks uh, indication through journalists that Ivanka, his daughter, the favorite, was one of those people. But your documentary seems to kind of indicate that that wasn't quite as true to the extent that that I think they wanted the public to believe. And I have one quote. This is not from your documentary, but it is from the January 6th committee. It's the outtakes from the statement that Trump is giving after January 6th, where Ivanka is the voice in the background helping him as he's making some edits to the statement. Let, let's play that clip and then let's talk about your perception of Ivanka. Okay, I'll, I'll do this. I'm going to do this. Let's go. But this election is now over. Congress has certified the results. I don't want to say the election's over. I just want to say Congress has certified the results without saying the election's over, okay? But Congress is certified. Now Congress is Yeah, certified. right. Now Congress is I didn't say over, so let, let me see. Don't go to the paragraph before. 
I found that clip very interesting because uh, always in the New York Times, the story is that Ivanka is pushing back in, in behind the scenes. But in this leaked footage, um, no, she wasn't. Uh, she was happy to let him edit his statement to not acknowledge that the election was over when it had been long over for two months and the Capitol had just been sacked because of his lies about it. So what is your sense? Maybe not as strong of pushback as she claimed in her public testimony. Sure. And, and in fact, there was the story where after the January 6th committee had shown a clip of her talking about how she had actually accepted Bill Barr's statement back at the beginning of December when he had spoken to AP mm-hmm. saying there was no basis whatsoever to support any of Trump's election claims. She said that she agreed with him. But in fact, about six or so days after that, she was interviewed by me at the White House where she doubles down on her father's position. And so this is again in December. This is yeah. And the election had been over for a month. I'm just trying exactly. to clarify the timeline here. This was not like uh, you're with her on the campaign trail during that one week between, you know, before the official call, right? Like we're into December and she she's yeah. telling you that, that no, she thinks she's with her dad on the fraud. Absolutely. You know, he, sh- he should you know, continue the fight was essentially what she said. And in fact, it was quite funny because when that clip was played by the January 6th committee, Trump came out against Ivanka, which was fascinating. And he said that she had already checked out and she wasn't involved in anything to do with the election. She didn't know what she was talking about. Well, in the interview that I did with her in December, she was definitely not checked out. And she absolutely knew exactly what was going on because she was quoting statistics, accurate statistics, in terms of how her father had performed in the 2020 election. So she was definitely with it. But she also did maintain the, the same position as her father. The, the differences between the kids is, is generally is, is about articulation, right? So Don Jr. would be far more vociferous and Ivanka yeah. would be a bit softer, perhaps. But if they ever depart from their father's position, that's very unusual. And it's most probably to avoid, I don't know, potentially being arrested, if anything. Right? I mean, like, <laughs> I was interested. Yeah. I forget which interview. I, re- I listened to a couple of interviews before this, and I was interested in something you said about how Ivanka and Don Jr. are actually very similar, mm. which is not, I don't think, their public perception. But were you just kind of referring to their both ambition? It's just kind of manifests itself differently. I think that's definitely one aspect that Ivanka does have a persona off camera, which is pretty interesting. And I haven't actually discussed that, to be honest, but she does <laughs> okay. have a... Okay, well, don't tease us. Well, come on. What is her persona? Her well, let, persona? let's just say that there are quite similar attributes between the way Don Jr. is on camera and the way Ivanka is off camera. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Come on. Give us a little something. Give us a little, give us a cookie. We're 40 minutes into this podcast. It's only the uh, real ones now. Yeah. No, I, I think she really does have a lot of attributes of her father and she will say it how she thinks. What, what I found so irritating and then also strange was how they all do this thing, the Trumps, uh, maybe Don Jr. less so, but, and Eric is a bit of an irrelevance in the grand scheme of things. But Ivanka and her father have this similarity in that they put on this very weird, persona when they go on camera like they and they actually do the same thing before, like like i mean literally the, exactly the same thing they both complain about how it's hot in the room and they wish the air conditioning was on and then they do this weird contortion with their face and essentially try and change character to be this type of person they think people want to see and and ivanka does i mean she's been doing this for so long that it's essentially become who she is uh, but there are these moments that i noticed when the cameras are not rolling, where she is willing to uh, to really, you know, tell me what she uh, what she thinks about certain things, and and uh, and and that and that did remind me of her of her father, and you know, she is someone that will express you know, emotion every now and then. But in, in the, to really answer your question, in terms of Don Junior and and Ivanka, their similarities, I mean, they they absolutely are obsessed with you know, the power and the. The influence that you have when you're when you're in the White House, right? I mean, he, obviously, he wasn't in the White House, you know, like the same way as she was, but he certainly had um, a very significant presence there for sure. I want to talk about one other person that you interviewed, um, which is the vice president. I thought, in in a weird way, I, I think maybe it's out of ex- because of expectations. I think your kind of expectation of, of any sort of interview behind the scenes is that the Trumps will look awful, and there's kind of this expectation that Mike Pence will look better by comparison. But in a lot of ways, I, I felt like that was not really the case. You were, in the slightest way, humanizing of the Trumps and Pence. I just think that because of the fact that he showed courage on the sixth people kind of gloss over his behavior between election day and the sixth, which was extremely cowardly. And, uh, and you give an interview with him 
I guess, um, well, t- tell us when the interview was, but I thought it was striking in the documentary that you show him. I'd forgotten that he's behind Trump on stage on election yes. night when he gives the speech that says, frankly, we didn't lose. I'd forgotten that Pence was there for that. Um, yeah. that and then he gives an interview with you, what, in December, I guess, where he's he's not showing any distance at all. I mean, he sounds like a, like a, a total loyal servant to trump so what, well, what was the context of that conversation well the, the context of that actually that interview with the vice president wasn't in december it was six days after january 6 it was on the 12th of january oh man and okay. yeah it was absolutely extraordinary that day and it, he was the most famous man in, in, in literally in the world because of all the 25th amendment stuff that was why going did on. he agree to that honestly i ask that every time i uh <laughs> talk about this why did anyone agree to this i mean yeah i think I, honestly, I don't know why. Okay, so anyway, give us the whole story. He he said six days after the sixth, and you're in. It looks like I, I, didn't, I couldn't tell the exact room, but you're in the White House. Well, yeah, we're in the vice presidential ceremonial office. It's actually it's an incredible room where every vice president for I don't know, decades signed this drawer when they leave office. And Mike Pence was actually showing us the his signature in this drawer. I mean, you see Harry Truman's signature, and obviously his signature is the biggest one. Like, you know, oh, Harry Truman's got this tiny signature, and you've got Mike Pence's massive, like, Sharpie pen. He's been with uh, Trump for too long. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, he comes and he sits down, and then his assistant gets an email on, on the phone, and, and essentially it was an email showing the draft resolution that was about to be voted on later on that evening to, to, to essentially get him to invoke the 25th, Amendment. Now, obviously, he was never going to do it, and he had already prepared his letter, which also, we found out later, is sent during that interview, where he writes to the Speaker saying that he's not going to be uh, invoking the 25th Amendment. But just that moment, capturing that moment, essentially live, you know, in the room, uh, was, was pretty extraordinary. And... Yeah, I mean, when we finished the interview, he he was actually very, he's a very charming guy, I have to say. And he apologizes for being late and then says, we had a bit going on today. I was just like, I mean, it's so remarkable that this White House was, it wasn't just the Trumps and the people around there, but it also included the vice president to to allow us in and to film these moments and to capture what they're thinking and saying at these times. I mean, this was six days after American citizens died on the steps of the Capitol, where he was almost essentially about to be assassinated at the behest of his boss, the President of the United States. And he's saying how he's not as good of a golfer as Donald Trump is. I mean, it's just extraordinary. (laughs) Yeah, he's like joshing about it and showing no distance. And I guess it says that he didn't want to talk about the sex that day. No. No, no, no. Did not want to talk about the sixth. No, no. The only person that wanted to talk about the sixth was President Donald Trump. I mean, uh, it's one thing you understand. He still has a job to do on the twelfth. So going back to office, making sure that there's a transition of power. But uh, if you're going to sit down with a documentarian for a Trump family documentary, and the Trump family had just sent a mob to kill you, <laughs> you would think, I don't know, there would be some sort of acknowledgement of that. But he was still in a pretty pliant moat there. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Okay, I, I have some rapid fire ones for you. You ready? Yeah. Um, uh, so you with Trump three times since, um, and uh, you know, there's always this. We we know we all never get to see the behind the scenes of the Trump mood. You know, you always hear, oh, he has a dark mood, etc. In the Washington Post, there are, there are twelve sources on background, but it comes to a head with this Cassidy story with the ketchup. You know, he's throwing it against the wall. You know, three times with him. What is your sense for that? Is that story believable? These are these dark Trump mood stories over overshot. What was the vibe like for you? Sure. I mean, there's definitely nothing in what Cassie said that is unbelievable. So I certainly see. I, I never saw any ketchup on any walls sure. or, 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 or you no know, tablecloths being pulled. But no, in the White House, he was when when he came in, he was furious and for lack of a better word, powerful. He, he sort of, he was furious and, and I was very scared. I mean, that was definitely the feeling I got after that interview. I was like, the shit is going to hit the fan. This is going to be a bad next few weeks. I mean, there was no question. He was going to go full on. I mean, I knew the night before I had predicted that there was going to be chaos. So that was very clearly by virtue of having met him and seen him in that moment, he was going to do everything he could to re- remain in power. So that was in the White House. In Mar-a-Lago, he looked terrible. He had put on a lot of weight. He was incredibly depressed. And a little behind-the-scenes secret, the reason for all of that was because he was going through a, a real withdrawal from not being able to use Twitter or any <laughs> social media. Yeah. 
I promise. I mean, that's literally what his closest aide said to me. He he was in the most terrible, foul mood uh, because he oh, wow. couldn't use uh, social media. Yeah, it was remarkable. I, mean, I do have to say, a little relatable. Okay, I don't know that I've ever <laughs> felt that way about Donald Trump, but maybe a little relatable. I dropped my phone over the weekend and uh, it broke, and so I'm now in right now in hour thirty six. And my mood is okay. I haven't put on any weight yet, but I could see the withdrawals <laughs> starting to kick in. Um, yeah. uh, and then we on the third meeting, Bed, Bedminster. In in Bedminster, he had uh, he was actually quite jovial and, and content, uh, but that was most probably because he had just uh, come back from a from playing golf, so he uh, was pretty chilled out because that's really his passion. So uh, he was he was certainly more relaxed in Bedminster than in the previous two for sure. Uh, what just in general around Mar-a-Lago, you know, in the months after January 6th, like that has to be kind of a surreal vibe. You know, you got the Cougars and the staff members and, you know, like the guys that own the local auto dealership and there's the classified documents laying around. I mean, that had to be a little bit of a trip. Uh, absolutely. And you know what was so interesting was I, I've actually not told anyone this. So obviously Mar-a-Lago is the worst place in the world, right, to ever right. store anything safe because it's a, you know, it's a members club and people are playing golf and you can obviously bring, you know, your guests in as well, right, if you remember. So, and, and the security is only over, around him. It's not, you know, sort of all over the place. I mean, obviously the entrances and things, but, yeah, sure. um, but people are walking around all over the place. I was walking around all over the place. So what Trump does in Mar-a-Lago and why he loves it there so much is that he just sort of walks around where people are having dinner just to get a round of applause. So he'll just walk into like the dinner area and obviously people are having dinner at different times and he'll walk in, there'll be a cheer and, and, he'll go, and he'll go out and then he'll go back in again and go out. So he just loves that adoration. And so then you can think, oh, hang on a second, you know, you know, he's probably not really selling classified documents to the Russians. He's probably just showing them off to people as to how cool it is, right? I mean, that's the kind of guy he is. You know, they, they said that they were looking in his bedroom drawers and things. I and mean, he's probably got his letters with Kim Jong Un, you know, but in his bedside table. And he uh, goes around and shows it off to people. That's the kind he is. I mean, you know, the, he literally walks into the room and I'm like, hello, Mr. President. And he totally ignores me and he just says, look at this floor. Isn't this the most beautiful flooring you've ever seen? And I'm just like, what are you talking about? I mean, it's a beautiful like a room. But like, I mean, it's just bizarre. Or like, you know, um, Mr. President, the last time, I, this is like the small talk. You know, the last time I uh, we, we met was at the White House a few months earlier. And he's like, oh, yeah, very nice at the White House. Yeah, but this is a much nicer setting, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's like a sitcom. You know, I mean, he, he, it's, it's so hilarious. You have to you brag think, about Mar-a-Lago by comparison to the White House. I know it's just absolutely extraordinary. So he he he's a very weird, unusual, simple, relatively old man. Yeah, the 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 for me the uh, classified documents. There are really only three potential explanations. One is he was trying a coup and shit was so wild that nobody knew where any <laughs> documents were, and they just threw shit into boxes and and sent it down there. And he's just being a stubborn bastard, right? That's one. Two, yeah. the most nefarious is that, you know, there's some sort of backroom dealing happening with MBS or whatever. That is your house of cards <laughs> potential explanation. And three is he really just likes to show shit off to the club members because he loves the attention. And like, it's as simple as that. He's like a man baby who wants to show off his toys to these strangers. And that third category has always been my theory. And that seems to, to jive with, with your sense. Absolutely. Of out down there. Absolutely. Yeah. He really is a really straightforward, simple guy. I mean, he is a man baby. I mean, for all intents and purposes. I mean, that's literally who he is. You know the story with the button on, his, on the desk in the Oval Office, Oh, right? yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the guy he is. Okay. Three little quick pet issues of mine. I'm not going to let you off here without, uh, without asking you about any of them. Uh, the first one is... During the documentary, Trump at one point says he feels that the room is very orangey. <laughs> what is he ta- What is he talking about? He thinks he, he looks too orangey, or correct? He's yeah. looking so at the, the image of himself on the camera. Exactly. So one of the things he asks is to see what he looks like before the interview starts. So there's a screen um, uh, sort of uh, facing him as so he sits down and he looks at the screen of him. He's looking at himself and he says. It looks too orangey. I don't know why that is. <laughs> I just—I thought he was moment, going for orangey. I thought that was his whole makeup routine. Exactly right. But like when he said that, I was just like, 
we could just leave now. We don't need to listen to any of this shit, you know? Like, that's it. That's uh, What do you that's... think he thinks he's going for? Like, bronze? Oh, or... I, I, I Honestly, I haven't got it. All bronze. I know is that he does do it himself. He, he spends about two hours in the morning. Yeah. Two full on. hours. Well, that's, that's useful personal time. Um, <laughs> during the campaign period and the after, were you ever around when there was business discussions? I, I do always feel like this is undercovered. Is like there's this question of, you know, whether he had a wall between himself and his businesses. I mean, uh, we're, like the kids were obviously campaigning very hard in the last 90 <laughs> days when you were with them, but they had to be also running his business too, right? Yeah. So, I mean, Eric was uh, in charge of the, of the company. Um, uh, but no, I mean, there was, there was no, uh, there, I mean, I did not see any sense of any wall whatsoever. I mean, this whole, the whole thing was incredibly, I mean, just, it, it was a free for all, a total free for all, uh, run by amateurs and really, and sycophants all the way through. I mean, that's what I saw. And then, and Trump, I mean, this is actually not in the documentary, but he does talk about how unfair it was that he had to, you know, he, he was very upset that if people stayed at his hotel and paid money that he would be told off about it. And, and he was always very upset about how much money it cost him to be the president of the United States and had to give up lots of lots of deals. Yeah, well. I'm always very skeptical if that's the case, but uh, we'll, we'll let that go. Okay, you, did, you said one thing on Reddit. I can't let it, I can't let it off. Okay? okay, I can't let you off the hook. You sent, complimenting you, you, your book. Yeah, uh, you did compliment my book. I, I wasn't going to mention that. That felt very Trumpy to bring that up. But thank you. I'm glad you brought it up. <laughs> um, I was going to mention that you answered a question that you said you heard some racism off camera. So I feel like I'd be a bad journalist if I didn't follow up with that. Is that really was that really true, or am I misunderstanding the the AMA? No, no, it's it is one hundred percent true. I don't want to go into too much detail for various reasons, but yeah, I mean, he is what people expect from Trump himself. No, we're not talking about the kids. Yeah. Yes, yeah, 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 so, yeah. I, and I also experienced it. I mean, he didn't say the N word. You would say that if you're saying the N word. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Casual white racism. You mean? Yeah, but it was a racism that I would say this is the most I'll go into that was directed somewhat personally. So there you go. Mm. So I actually experienced that. But yeah, he, he, he at best he doesn't have a clue what he's saying most of the time. So you know, I'm not saying that therefore you no, know, right, right, right. That, that, that I'm not trying to condone it. I'm just saying that yes, the answer is that I did see and hear it uh, and also experienced it as well. Huh. Um, anybody heard? Have you heard from anybody? Any of the Trump family members? Ooh, I can't anybody? tell you that. Okay. I can't tell you that. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Uh, my old friend Caroline, have you heard from her? She might be listening right now. You can say hi to her if you want. Uh, hi, Caroline. I don't know if she even remembers me, but all I can say is that there is, um, let's just say that not everything that is uh, that that is captured on the day that we film her is in the documentary. There you go. I'm going to get so much trouble for saying You have that. a lot of good teasers, <laughs> Alex Holder. Well, look, uh, that will, this will mean that you have to come back for a Thursday night Bulwark live stream, which we do after a few drinks. Uh, if you're a Bulwark Plus member you can jo- uh, and you haven't uh, joined, we're bringing Thursday night Bulwark back next week. We've been on a little August vacation. And so, uh, you know, we'll get a couple pops in you and see if I can't do a better job as a probing host, uh, getting some more of We've this uh, more, more of this gossip. Um, out of you. So, any any anything else? Any uh, final plugs for unprecedented Discovery Plus? Highly recommend it. No, I, I mean, yeah, you've done an amazing job, Tim. And this has been really fun. I actually say this is probably the most enjoyable. Okay, I can't say most, but one of the most enjoyable podcasts I've done. It was really great. <laughs> this was really fun. Okay, well, I'm doing my best. Well, thank you very much, Alex Holder. Um, it has been my honor. I was so happy to see you in DC, and hopefully, we can get together soon. Uh, keep an eye on us and the bulwark. We'll be monitoring your increasingly chippy Twitter feed, which I've noticed uh, <laughs> now that you're off the clock uh, on the movie. And um, for the uh, bulwark listeners, um, I will be back in the host chair tomorrow with another very fun guest, and we'll do it all over again. Peace. <laughs>